Okay. Hello, hello, everybody. I hope that you are enjoying this sunshiny day. Uh, today, we're going to continue on with our postures in the <clears throat> Yoga Anatomy book from Leslie Kamenoff and Amy Matthews. And just to um, recap, they, there is version one and then version two. Uh, typically what we see in yoga teacher training is that version two. And I do recommend that for that granular learning piece and really getting in into the why behind the what. Um, but I, I personally like the first version and that it talks more about what's happening within the asana. And then while we do dip our toe into the why, it's less so and more about what are the primary movers when we're in the posture and what are the benefits um, in doing them? And that's that's kind of what this series is all about. Uh, this, this book is divided up in, in different sections and I'll just, I'll touch base on them for you. Uh, we talk here about dynamics of breathing, yoga in the spine, understanding the asana, but then breaks down to standing poses, sitting poses, kneeling poses, supine poses, prone poses, and arm support poses. And I really like this approach in that when you're putting together a class plan design for your creative classes in yoga teacher training, you know, we try and do that. We try and put in like four sequences together that are standing, four sequences together that are sitting. And then that way, it's, it's a nice way to start to build the foundation for how to put together our programming without reinventing the wheel each and every time we do it. Uh, one, one thing we'll want to see in a more refined approach to this style of teaching is not only are they sitting, standing, and so on, in that we have a nice smooth class that we're delivering, but also that we're trying to touch on the primary movers, the main muscles that are being worked, and how do we get a well-rounded class that hopefully reaches as the practitioners from head to toe and doesn't overwork any one particular area. Uh, I've seen this, let's say, in some themed classes, such as come to my hip opener class would, would be an example. And while we're all for opening up the hips, we wouldn't want to spend 60 minutes doing so. So we wanna, we wanna make sure that we understand the, the basic components of what we're looking for. Some key things that I would often suggest is making sure that you put those twists in, in perhaps even the back bend and any sort of big movements where the spine comes away from neutral towards the back half of the class after we have warmed the body up. So one really nice way to do that is to fire up, do your core work. So maybe some core work in the beginning of the class and I'll differentiate which of these postures I would find personally suitable to be in the front half of the class um, and which one's not. And I'll try and point out why. And so that'll, that'll be kind of the essence or the theme of today's lesson, if you will. Uh, so featured here is the lovely Monica. Uh, she did a great job demonstrating the postures that are found in Kamenoff's book. Uh, lovely, lovely form, but by no means is it a standard of where you might personally want to go or where your students might personally want to go because we're all individuals in that way. So let's start off, shall we? If you're opening up to the first version, I'm on page 116. If not, you can go back to the uh, glossary or the table of contents and look up boat pose. And that's, that's where we are. We see quite a bit of core work, obviously in boat pose. Warming up the core is a really nice way to uh, get fire up not only the primary movers, but also loosen up and heat up the connective tissue so that the, the movement of the muscle is encouraged and embraced by the connective tissue that surrounds it and is nice and warm and pliable. Depending on the modification that you take or offer, if the practitioner has chosen to bend their knees and drop their feet, then we may see less work in the primary movers in the back of the calf there. We might see less work there and that's okay. Maybe pick it up with some heel rises in, in mountain earlier in the class or something like that. 
Uh, in here, we do see a nice lengthening, not only of the front of the thigh, but also the back which is why I think this is such an effective, effective posture to try and shimmy in whenever possible. Um, in most cases, many of us um, do quite a bit of sitting in life, and I can't speak for everyone ever all the time, always, never, but generally speaking, um, we have quad dominant where the front of the thighs is stronger and the back of the thighs and hamstrings are shorter and could benefit from some lengthening and balancing of the muscular system that surrounds, is, surrounds the thigh in general. So talking about the front and the back and the inner and outer thighs. So commonly we see the outer edges of the thighs more developed than the inner thigh. And that, that symphony can oftentimes cause low back pain and tension. So let's move our way through this picture here. As we see, we see the glutes are fired in working, which is, this is really, really nice one enhanced by, you know, a good old fashioned wall sit or something of, of the like in yoga class, I would say chair pose could partner nicely with that. So if you were doing like yoga and glutes class, this one qualifies for sure. And it would even if the toes are down or if the toes are up. So again, assessing what is it that I'm trying to get out of this posture and why am I doing it? Why am I acting my practitioner to do it? And what is it they need from it will denote the modifications offered and the qualities given. Qualities are how to go about doing something and cues are what to do. And depending on your different language skills, my cue might sound like your quality and vice versa, but it's just important that you approach the class in that you want your, your, your student body to have something to do and then get into how you want them to do it. And then with the modifications piece, you know, what else they could do, what, how could we change it up to make it more accessible or, or perhaps even um, more refined, right? And these are different, different ideas. What is the purpose of the class? What are we trying to do? So as we move on up from the glutes, we see front and back body both fired up. So this is a really great one in every way. There's um, a soft bend in Monica's upper back through her thoracic spine, uh, but her low back, her lumbar spine is nice and flat and not rounded. So if the low back was rounded, we would want to either drop the hands to the floor for support or bend the knees and invite either one or both feet to the ground, you know, depending on what works finding a lengthening up through the neck muscles as well. It's just so important and so healthy to strengthen those muscles, particularly to counteract some of the looking down or hunching forward we might do, either via typing on a computer or a phone, walking around texting, things like this. It's really important to bring the, the body back to a neutral place, but also to support the head that it only goes back as far as it can before the pose falls apart. So in this way, I've, I've carried the story of boat from the toes through the hips, up the spine to the head, and then however far back the head can go without the thing falling apart is, is how far back it would go. So um, I would usually cue it in that order. We have a lengthening of hamstrings, meaning this is a really nice one for like a yoga for runners class, or uh, if, if folks do a lot of sitting and they have tight backs, tight lower lumbar spines, uh, usually the culprit is imbalanced muscles and shorter hamstrings. So we want to lengthen the hamstrings out and we want to strengthen it all up. So I hope that that is of benefit to you. As we move into chapter six, we're coming into kneeling poses. So if you're working on your created class, uh, which comes with four, four different sequences there in your workbook, in the upper right-hand corner, you would write kneeling poses and choose four kneeling poses. And I'll, I'll demonstrate some of them here for you. Uh, I think it's worthwhile to consider which ones are prone face down in which ones are supine face up. So I'll give you a moment to open that up and then we'll go on to the kneeling poses.
Okay, hopefully you had a chance to take some notes and jot down some of your thoughts on that. I think it's really beneficial to do a journaling reflection whenever possible, as close to a lesson as you can, just to uh, do a little bit of a brain dump, you know, put down on paper what stood out to you and know that um, my experience took years and years and years to be able to deliver this to you and uh, to definitely just take what you can from the buffet of knowledge and revisit it from time to time to move towards mastery. So that's, that's what we're aiming to do. So with our kneeling postures here, we've got re reclining hero pose. I'm on page 120. And much like boat, we have quite a bit of movement and both the front and the back of the body, which is quite nice. Now, I don't know that this would be the case, perhaps if the arms were not overhead, then we would not see an engagement of the lats there. So if, if we chose the modification or even the cure quality to be arms alongside us, then we might not see the lats working. Um, and also if we chose to have maybe the knees bent, that would impact everything from the glutes down, but we would still get the work through the core and the pecs, the chest as well. So again, like what are we asking of our practitioners? Where are they? Who are we teaching? You know, if we were going to, let's say we were teaching um, a, um, a silver sneakers class, right? Which, which starts at whatever age, that starts at this, this I don't believe would be appropriate. Or if, or if we had a personal session, a private session with somebody who had knee replacements, you know, I, I don't know that this would be what I would choose. So instead I would quite likely bring the soles of the feet to the mat and uh, the knees together and maybe have the emphasis be on, imagine you have a squishy ball in between the thighs or perhaps pass out little squishy balls for in between the thighs, which I've done and is fun to have the toys and the props and things like that as they're available to you or your practitioner. Uh, a word on toys and props, less is more, pick two or three for the class and call it good. You don't wanna pull out your whole toy box. Um, it can be overwhelming and intimidating for your student and the instructor alike. Moving on to our muscles here. The main key thing one here I see is the stretch happening in the abs. And if we've chosen to bring the feet back as, as Monica has demonstrated, then we're gonna have a nice stretch in the front of the hamstring. In my opinion, I don't know the benefits outweigh the risks on this one. And I think there's a number of ways that you could, you could get the stretch from, from the hips down another way, maybe in a different part of your class. And, uh, and instead bring your focus to lengthening the core here and getting that nice pec stretch, bringing the arms overhead, grabbing in the lats and the psoas major as well. Uh, commonly those psoas muscles can do quite, quite a number on low back pain by tugging and pulling. And what we have is an attachment to the bowl of the pelvis and the bowl of the pelvis when pulled on or tugged and, and as soon as it moves away, from being level or even between front and back and left and right can usually show up as uh, discomfort or even pain. So I would probably take a rec reclining hero, hero pose if I were to teach this in one of my classes at Edge in, in South Naperville, I would probably bend the knees and invite the feet to the mat. And then I would cue from hips up and then I would invite those who want to tuck the feet behind. I have that in their practice. Feel free to do so. Um, that being said, I definitely focus on all levels yoga. And, and oftentimes my students will, you know, look to some of my instructors at Edge that do teach um, a more seasoned class that offer refinement and postures such as these. And that's okay. If, if that's what your class is titled and the description is of, and that is your, um, is your student body, then by all means, you would want to, to cue this fully. But just from my own perspective, uh, what you see in blue there is what's touching the floor. So the red is what's fired up and the blue is what's touching the floor, what's making contact to the floor. This can go such a long way if you really study this one before your class in telling them what it is you're seeking them to feel, like what it is that you want them to, to do. And so one example might be, we know that we're not asking that the low back meet the ground. 
because it's not shaded blue there. And then we're really more looking for the hips and the shoulders and the arms and then the, uh, the shins and the top of the feet to make contact. So why don't you take a moment just to read over this page here, uh, write up a journal reflection and we'll continue on in just a few moments. Moving on to the next posture. Okay, so let's flip on over to child's pose on page 122. Still classified as kneeling. Although I would take note that we are now prone face down and no longer supine face up. So we might have put together boat pose and recline hero pose together and then back to boat pose and then maybe a forward fold and that would work. Um, but I wouldn't put child's pose in, in that same sequence because we have our, our practitioner flipping and flopping. For those of you that didn't know, featured on page 122, this is actually Amy. And they brought in an artist to draw out what was happening with the anatomy. So it's always kind of a fun fact to know, you know, who these pictures are. I just thought they were they were random bodies, but they're not. Uh, we're also see Leslie Kamenoff in here and a man named Jay. So with that, as we move on to child's pose, we might see the arms reaching forward. We might see a block set under the forehead. We might see the arms alongside us, as featured here, as Monica has done. And we might see this called something else. So in, in some um, lineages, we see this called seal. 
and that's okay too. There is no right or wrong. What we have is 80,000 documented yoga sana with a number of different people coming from different lineages and approaching these postures in different ways. And honestly, I would say that's to be celebrated. So in that way, if a student should come to you and say, well, I noticed that you, that you cued child's pose, the hands behind, and normally I do hands before is, is that not right? Or am I doing it wrong or something like that? Just remind them that, you know, these are just different expressions of ways to find movement within the body. And, and I believe that that's the best gift that you can give a practitioner. So as you look at the book here, again, we have quite a bit of engagement. And what we really have here in Child's Pose is so nice is, is, is the rib cage here is fired up and a lengthening through those spinal extensors. And these guys hold the body upright all day long. And so giving them a chance to just rest and come forward with ease and allow gravity to assist, I think is such a beautiful gift. And for me, one of the reasons why child's pose feels so nice. Um, when taking a modification in this particular posture, we might see knees together, we might see knees apart, we might see hips down, we might see hips up. I personally prefer to have the forehead on the ground and then the knees and the hips can do whatever they need to do to have that happen. Now that could be on the ground with a block or without a block. And the reason for it is there's, there's a nurturing quality to this. And if you look at the picture, you see in blue on Amy's forehead here, that's making the contact to the ground. If you go back to when, when you're a baby and you're nursing with a mother, this is a very soothing area. If, if you ever feel stressed or the world might seem to be moving a little bit more quickly than you'd like in the moment, do you ever find yourself bringing your hand to your forehead and finding that to be calming? So in that way, um, that is first things first for me. So I would rather see my practitioners taking that grounding uh, contact than having their hips all the way down and the knees together and the knees apart. Largely has more to do with tightness of the hips there and the ladder. Uh, and again, like having the tops of the toes and the shin on, on the mat is commonly seen, but maybe what, what your practitioner needs is a flexed foot, which is going to change it up. And that's okay too. So really what we're looking for is what we see in the front of the back of the legs and through the spinal extensors and through the rib cage here. And I, and it written here, it says gravity draws the yielding body deeper into this pose. It isn't that low. Lovely. Like allow gravity to assist and embrace, you know, Mother Earth. Al allow allow the practitioner to fall in her bosom and just be in that space. So here's a nice opportunity to bring your attention to breathing, although it might be uncomfortable if you're asking for very large breath movements. So you could play around with that one. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to read through these pages and jot down any notes that you'd like to, or journal reflections, and then we'll continue on.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Hopefully you had a few minutes just to jot down a journal reflection, maybe point out some key things that stood out to you and read through the pages in the book. You know, this book, oftentimes what we have in required reading, um, I know it, uh, my experience with, with the number of courses that I've taken is we have all these books and we, they arrive in the mail the first day or at the bookstore, hopefully their local bookstore. And we get so excited, we go through it. And then as we get deeper into our journey, you know, maybe the book starts to collect a little bit of dust. So this one though, let that not happen to this book. Let this book be um, your guide, your handbook, the one that you carry with you and you refer to when putting together class plans, or maybe even just choose a hero pose or a peak pose for your class that you just study a little further than you would the others and do that one a week by the end of the year, you would have 52 of them under your belt and your, your classes would reflect that experience. So I recommend that very, very highly. There are other books. Um, in my experience, I've also seen people um, try and tackle so many books that we end up a master of none. So just consider that as a possibility. So moving on to Camel Pose, page 124, if in the first edition, otherwise head on over to your table of contents and look that one up. Uh, what we have here demonstrated as Monica has done is just a beautiful job as is Amy of the hips projecting forward enough that it's supporting the low back. And that's ultimately what we're really looking for. So it's not so much whether or not the hands do or don't touch the heels. It really is more, can the hips be forward and we not have compression on the lumbar spine, but we do have engagement of the psoas major. So take a look at the picture here in the anatomy book just to observe that. What are we trying to work here? What are we trying to work here? Perhaps you walk your practitioners through an experience where their hands start off on their lumbar spine with an invitation to bring the hands to the heels. And maybe the toes are on the mat or maybe the feet are flexed, right? And so these are choices that the individual makes based on how they're feeling that day, what's right for them. And it might be different on Monday than it is Tuesday, right? And that that's okay. Uh, as, as we look at the posture, what I think the, the real win on this one is, is this stretch that is experienced waist up. And that is why I would probably more readily bring the hands to the low back and stretch out that, that, that uh, the whole front body there, which is just so beautiful and really even right to the apex of the lungs. So, you know, this one could be nice to go say from a hero or sometimes called thunderbolt posture uh, and then come up into a camel pose and then come down and do a pranayama series of some breathing techniques and then maybe return to camel and then back down to the hero, some more breathing techniques. That could be a really beautiful sequence. And then maybe on, on the um, end of it, see a downward facing dog from that hero. You know, that, that could be a really nice way to get practitioners, you know, in movement. I would not recommend they hop out of bed and do the sequence because we still have a back bend here. And when we have a back bend, we wanna make sure that the body is nice and warm so that the connective tissue is nice and pliable and ready for the movement and less apt to have any injury. So keeping that in mind. So the other thing we start to see here is we make our way from waist down on the anatomy here is the glutes are fired, the front of the, of the legs are fired, um, and the hamstrings are fired, but less so. So in this way, we might, we might want to, um, we might want to have some more postures in your sequence that are dedicated to the lengthening of the hamstrings and the downward facing dog sequence would accomplish that. So that's something that you could really consider. If I did this posture, if I, let's say I did hero to camel to hero to camel to hero to child's to downward facing dog to child's to downward facing dog to child to hero, for example, if I did that, 
then I would be stretching the front of the body and stretching the west, the back of the body as well. So consider, consider these things. If I was in that downward facing dog, I would probably, uh, if paired with this, I'd probably invite my practitioners to pedal the heels, lengthen one heel to the mat for a time and hold for like a long pause and then switch and so on uh, with, you know, maybe, maybe those heels reach the mat together and maybe they never do, but at least they get that stretch if you're pedaling the heels one at a time. And so in that way, I would say it partners nicely with this particular posture. So I do hope that is a benefit to you there. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to jot down some journal reflections and to read through these pages, page 124 and 125, and then we will resume on. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. That that was a benefit to you and had a chance to jot down some notes. Work on this one. Let's find our way to page 126. One-legged royal pigeon pose. And so in this posture, we did a number of sequences. I did ask Monica to go with one hand rather than two, although she actually did have it in her practice to do with two. We did play around with this posture to include props such as a strap to reach that foot. Um, we played around with this posture where the hand came down and so on. And the reason for it is that most folks I think can find this place with the hips forward, but once those hands, both hands try reaching the foot, mo many folks in many all levels classes that I teach, um, the form oftentimes kind of falls apart. And what we have is a hinging at the low back or even at the very bottom of the thoracic spine. And when that happens, it changes up the dynamic of the primary movers and what we're trying for. So. For that reason, I probably am happy to just get one foot and maybe do it twice, once on each side. So here, as you can see, this posture is also demonstrated as the very front of the Yoga Anatomy book, which I think it is just such a, a beautiful posture to work towards in life and much can be accomplished here. Um, we do still have a lengthening of the um, 
of the entire body with the exception of the triceps. So at the back of the arm, we don't have that. So open that up and take a read on those pages. We'll give about two minutes for you to read through these and then I'll continue on. Okay, so hopefully you had a chance to read through those pages. And again, remember, there's no final, there's no exam. I'm not here to test you. I'm here to introduce you to um, some new ideas or some refinement of existing ones. So when we when we go through this, what we definitely see whether both hands reach back or not is work from the waist up through the whole front of the body, which again is not seen in so many different postures. This can be great work to counter um, to counter some core work that you've done. So if you've done maybe you have in your class a shataranga, and then you've come up into a cobra or upward facing dog. And then we've slowly moved into like a child pose to counter that a little bit from extension to flexion with the spine and then come back to that chaturanga, group plank, dropping the hips, coming into that cobra, sphinx or upward facing dog, whatever you like. You could then, you could then position yourself to move into downward facing dog and maybe one leg to rise, bend at the knee to open the hip and then send that leg forward into pigeon. Once there, invite your practitioners to bend at the knee and reach for the foot, finding themselves in one legged royal pigeon pose. And I, you know, I would say that that sequence is, is one I've taught many, many times in that if you're moving quite slowly and allowing enough air around, your practitioner to move in and out of these postures, I think that it's really beneficial and they can get so very much from it. So just consider some of the different ways that you can get that done. You know, that's, that's really, really good, good work there. I would also, um, I would commonly, you know, there's, there's some controversy around how to modify this. You know, um, some folks have their emphasis on the shin needs to be parallel with the top of the mat. The purpose of that is to protect the knee. 
But essentially what I really find, and I know I've, I've heard in Leslie Kamenoff's live Zooms that I take with him, is that this posture has more to do with the flexibility of the hip joint. And so if the flexibility in the hip joint isn't there, then trying to crane the, the leg to be parallel with the top of the knee or with the top of the mat would actually um, torque the knee, not protect it. So dealer's choice on how you go about doing that. Um, some people have said things like, if, if you want a little support, put a block underneath that hip. In this case, it would be the right hip. Um, I don't know that I subscribe to that unless you have those nice um, round, um, round blocks. I, I think a, a square block is uncomfortable. And I, I don't know that it works. It sounds good in theory, but I don't know that it, it works. Um, I'd rather see maybe a a bolster or rolled up blanket or something like that for support. Uh, but even before I did any of those things, unless it was a restorative class or a prenatal class, uh, you probably more readily see me just not bring the um, hips down so far. So as seen here, Monica demonstrates the, uh, the hips are up in there. The, the body is not laying on the knee or laying on the shin or the foot. So I did ask her to bring the foot in a little closer because I find many practitioners, this is where their foot actually tends to go. Our more seasoned yogis might have the shin up to the top of the mat, but again, rarely do you see that in their group class. So these are just some considerations that we want to take. At the end of the day, you know, your class is going to be geared towards the people who show up for you and you want to teach with authenticity and what your practice reflects and how you can share what you love about yoga and what you know about yoga and how you do yoga with the people in front of you. And that might be completely different than some of the things that I pointed out today. And that's completely fine and to be celebrated. I would just simply invite you to understand that when you teach, you teach from a place of purpose and intention and there's a reason for the props that you're giving or there's a reason for the qualities or cues or modifications that you're giving and that that lends back to what's happening with the with the body and how does this benefit the practitioner and as always do the benefits outweigh the risks so i hope you've enjoyed this anatomy lesson we will be taking a five minute break and then we'll be getting into our groups uh i'd be remiss if i didn't mention feel free to for hold forward in this posture is seen as page 128 uh, we'll take a five minute break and then we'll come into our group so take a couple minutes to write down your journal reflection and read through these pages here let's say we'll We'll reconvene in eight minutes to give you plenty of time to read through these pages, write your journaling reflection, pop in any notes you, you have, take a couple of minutes to yourself, and I'll see you at one. Namaste.